to save these whales and save human lives. Offshore wind is coming. Boats need to be built. We need to build a proper boat to save these whales. Watch this video. It's important. This is a very important message I have to share with you folks. This has to stop before it's too late. It's going to save a lot of lives. So take a couple of minutes and watch this video and follow along with me, would you please? It's really, really important. Well, I put this presentation together entitled it How to Build a CTV Fleet for the U.S. Offshore Wind Farms Without Killing People. And I put this thing together because I want to save some lives here. I want to save human lives and I want to save whale lives. Bear with me. This is going to get interesting. Now we're building these windmills on the east coast of the United States of America. And it gets rough out there. It gets rough in the northeast Atlantic. And to be honest, the boats like this are simply not going to cut it. They're too small. They're too light, they're aluminum, and they just are not efficient. They may work fine overseas where the wind farms are, you know, four, five, six, eight miles away from the beach. Great. But the windmills we're talking about in the Northeast Atlantic off the United States here are a lot more than that. They're 12 to 50 miles offshore, the closest one being about 12 to 18. And these little aluminum boats, these 65 footers going 20 knots in the Northeast Atlantic are not going to make it. The boats are going to break and what's worse is it's going to hurt people. So let's go through this a little bit, okay? I want to cover five things with you on this video. One, how these boats are going to kill people. How they're an enormous waste of energy and they're going to create an, a huge carbon footprint. And I thought that's why we were doing offshore wind, was to cut back on the carbon footprint. They're going to create a logistical nightmare with all of these boats going back and forth on a daily basis. And they're whale killers. They're going to kill whales. <clears throat> I don't care how you put it, one way, shape, or form. Think of this a minute. You have two vehicles driving down the road. You have a Prius going about 85 and you have, say, an Escalade going 55. And here comes a, uh, a, a porcupine that moves slow going across the road, or a raccoon, or any little rodent like that that goes across the street, a possum, going across the street slow. The Prius is going to come, this little teeny tiny Prius at 85 mile an hour is going to hit this possum, going to knock it off the side of the road and kill it dead, right? And it's just going to be a bump. By the time the driver realizes it, it's way too late. Boom, boom, boom. Looks around and there's nothing yet. Now you take the guy with the Escalade. Driving down the road at 55, which is speed limit, 55 mile an hour. He, and he sees up ahead, he has time, and he sees up ahead a raccoon or a possum or a porcupine. And he swerves and gets out of the way and goes, oh, look at that little rodent. And he gets by and everything's fine. Meanwhile, like I said, the possum, I mean the... Uh, um, the Prius going at 85, bam, kills it. What's the difference between a 65 foot boat going 25 knots, the Prius, or a 110 foot boat going 10 knots, which is the speed limit when the right whales are around? Think about it a minute. I don't care what the government says about it. I don't care what the government writes about it. I don't care the rules that they do. Just think about it here. Common sense. These 65-foot aluminum boats going 20 and 25 knots are going to kill a whale. They hit one, it's over. Just like a Prius hitting a possum at 85. Let's get back into the rest of the presentation because that's only this is only a little piece of the common sense part of these boats. The fifth item we're going to cover, getting back to this here, the fifth item we're going to cover is I'm going to share with you a simple common sense solution to service the offshore windmills without 65 foot boats running around at 20 knots hurting people. Now, you're getting back to these boats. Now, they may be well-built boats. As a matter of fact, I know they're well-built boats because I went all through one in a shipyard in Rhode Island about six months ago before the engines were put in it. And I know what I'm talking about with boats. Uh, I knew the shipyard. I know boats. We'll get into that. These boats are built really, really well. The designer knows his stuff okay the boats are really built well i mean i actually said to the builder 
I said, you could probably take this boat and drop it 50 feet off of a crane and she would bounce and it wouldn't do any damage to the boat. And the boat builder agreed. Then I said, but if there was a person in that boat, that person would hurt and they didn't disagree. So one thing in common with all of these boats, and look these up yourself online, okay? Just Google OSVs or offshore wind boats or anything else like that. CTVs, Google images, and that's you'll see all of these boats. That's where these pictures came from, okay? It's public knowledge of these boats. Pretty pictures, nice looking boats, okay? A little odd looking from American standards, but nice looking boats, very functional, functional. But it's calm weather, and it's not calm where we are. I'll show you that in a minute. Now again, these things are fast. No doubt about it, they're running people back and forth on a daily basis. Well, it's not if you hit a rogue wave, it's when, and when you do, how many people are gonna get hurt or killed. I mean, the weakest link of the boat is the human passenger. And I wanna show you something here, and this comes from a lot of years experience. See this thing here, this open part in the bow? That's called the tunnel. Talk to anyone that owns a catamaran. You can't build a catamaran with a high enough tunnel. These things come down in the head sea and they hit hard, they shake, they shudder, and they're known to break right here, right where the tunnel meets the hull in the bow. They're all known to break. I know some boats, we know some boats, friends of ours that have one, that there's only two people allowed to run the boat because of that fact. Now let's get back to the presentation a little bit. Again, the weakest link on the vessel is going to be the human body. You're going to ride someone out there 50 miles. You're going to beat the technicians up on the way out because you have thousands of miles of open ocean. I'm going to prove it to you. And so the water is rough offshore and you have changing currents all the time, which makes it even more unpredictable in the, East, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean here on our side on the East Coast. And these boats are expensive to run, okay? They're going to work more or less 220 to 240 workdays, thereabout. They're going to put about 1,600 hours on the engines, running at full speed, okay? About five hours a day each, uh, each way, two and a half out, two and a half back, maybe a little more. I'm not counting the time that they're idling back and forth here. I'm just talking about when they're running. They're going to burn 150 gallons of fuel an hour. You take 3,000 horsepower, you pull it out, okay, it's going to cost you uh, five gallons of fuel per hour per hundred horsepower is what it is. So it's simple math, 150 gallons of fuel an hour, 240 work days, 240,000 gallons of fuel each year for each boat. And I just have to ask, isn't also wind supposed to lessen the carbon footprint? We're going to have probably, my guess, a hundred of these boats around. So up and down the coast. So you take 100 boats burning 240,000 gallons of fuel a year. What does that come to? 24 million gallons, isn't it? It's a lot of fuel. A lot of carbon footprint. A lot of it, CO2 going out the exhaust here and into the airspace. I just want to bring that up because, it's, you know, I'm questioning it. And these boats are expensive to run. We already touched the 3,000 horsepower, right? We already got that. They're expensive. And I'll tell you why. Very high maintenance costs. These jet engines on these boats, these uh, jet pumps rather, are really expensive. They're very expensive to maintain. Much more expensive than a propeller boat. Seals go. You plug up the intakes. Bearings go. Rams go. They have to be maintained annually. Taken, hold out, taken apart, put back together. How do I know that? Because we have friends that have these jet drive boats, okay, passenger ferry boats, and every year they haul them out, they have to completely rebuild, rebuild the jet drives, very costly, and God help you if you hit something with them, because they're cast aluminum, and if you hit something, they break, okay, so then you have to get a whole new part, you're going to have many wasted days of weather off uh, on the east coast, and I'll tell you why, most weathermen don't even know this for crying out loud, because they never spent any time out in the ocean. If you have dew on the windows in the morning, it could be a little weather uh, uh, education here. If you go out in the car in the, to your car in the morning and you have dew on the windows, that means you're going to have an onshore breeze 
during the day, okay? It's going to start about 11 o'clock in the morning. It depends. The more dew, the more wind, and the harder it's going to blow. That's an onshore wind. So if you're down in Virginia, it's going to come out of the east. If you're up in Massachusetts, it's going to come out of the southwest. It's that way. It's been that way since who knows when, my entire life. So you're going to have boats going out in really nice days, <clears throat> and they're going to go offshore, and they're going to get almost to the windmills, and it's going to start blowing 30, and they're not going to be able to work. They're going to have to go home. So they're wasting all that fuel, all that payroll, all of that time with people on the vessel, and they're going to have to go home and get no work done. Or you're going to have other days that happen specifically in the fall, especially in the fall. You're going to wake up in the morning, and it's going to be blowing northwest, North northwest, I should say, north northwest to north northeast in that quadrant, and it's going to be blowing thirty or forty. The boats aren't going to leave. What happens when the wind's coming out of the west, out of the north northeast and north northwest like that? Is it always drops out in the afternoon by about eleven o'clock with a change of tide? So, how many boats do you think are going to be sitting there at the dock, blowing forty mile an hour, and they're going to go out knowing that the weather's going to get nice in the afternoon? None. They're all going to sit at the dock. It's been proven, I mean, fishermen that don't know the weather patterns waste more time at the dock and kick themselves. They're walking around the parking lot kicking stones because they never, ever learned the simple thing about the weather. It was handed down to me from my grandfathers. Both of my grandfathers are both fishermen. So you're going to have a lot of wasted days for these boats. They're not going to get paid when they're sitting at the dock. That's for sure. I have a copy of a contract that's used in the Gulf of Mexico. And the boats that are waiting on the weather, they don't get paid much. And if they have breakdowns, they don't get paid at all. They're allowed a certain amount of breakdown days per year during the contract, and that's it. Now, these boats are really too short to reach across the sea either. So 65 feet is just not the right size. I've had boats from 55 feet up to 110. We have a couple, my family has a couple boats now. The smallest one is, is uh, 65 feet, and she only sails in the summertime. Let me tell you what happens with the sea. It's with a 55 or 65 foot boat, they, don't, they can't reach across from sea to sea, so they go up and down and around. And it makes it rough as rough can be. I actually sold my 90 footers and bought a low 55 footer, figuring, well, I can only, I, this way I'll only have to go fishing when the weather's nice, when it's nasty. I don't have to leave the dock. Well, that 55 foot boat was the biggest mistake I ever made because it was always rough. For very few days was it calm. I'm telling you, these boats are not going to work. You're going to need additional dockage because there's going to be about 100 of them and they're going to come to the dock on a daily basis. You're going to need additional parking because everyone's going to drive to the boat. And that, like I said before, they're going to be right whale killers. I don't care how you put it, if you take a Prius and you hit a porcupine at 85 mile an hour, you're going to kill a porcupine. The same thing with a 65 foot boat going 20 knots. You hit a right whale, it's dead. Do we really want to kill these things, they're slow moving creatures, they have all sorts of speed limits. And the difference between a 65 foot boat and a 66 foot boat is only one foot. No, I may be wrong on the, on the feet-wise. It may be 64.9 feet. It might be 63 feet or something like that. But you get the point, okay? One foot isn't going to make a difference. Now, the biggest problem with the offshore wind business is no one else has had the guts to bring this up. No one else that I know of has had the experience offshore to know exactly what's going to happen with these boats. And there's one boat, one of these 65 footers sailing out of Block Island for the Block Island farm. And it's perfect. It's the perfect size. It's a perfect application. The windmills are only five miles from the beach. So it's good. But going further offshore, it's not going to be any good. <clears throat> so look, I've been doing this for 30 years or so. Here's one of my boats. I was coming in actually on this trip. It's windy, it's cold, and it's dangerous in the wintertime. And aluminum boats have no place to be there. Let's take a look at some Google Earth, well, shall we? Here's the center of the windmill south of Malta's Vineyard, more or less. This isn't exact, but this is more or less, and I'll show you that uh, in a second. Actually, let me see the sample here. Here we go. South of Malta's Vineyard, there's a 55-mile mark, okay? And this is the uh, lease area for the different leases, different colors for the different, different developers. Let's get back to this. 55.24 miles from New Bedford out to the windmills. Once you hit this corner right here at the, uh, at the light ship or the buoy, we call it the Iron Horse, 
right here is um, off a of cutty hunk. You make that turn, this gets nautical in there. It gets pretty rough for this ride. And I'm going to show you that right now. Let's take a look at this. Let's expand on this. That's where the windmills are. That's where the wind farm is. Now, they're going to be up and down the coast here, obviously. But this is the one south of Martha's Vineyard. It's a big ocean here. Big ocean. And it gets rough. Here's the Mr. Bill. This is a personal friend of mine. I've known the guy since I was 12 years old. Running the Mr. Bill coming in right past where the exact windmill areas I'm talking about. Right through here, coming in from a fishing trip. Someone was on another boat and they took a picture. He was getting his brains beat in. This is a 85 foot boat, I believe. She's steel. She has outriggers. And she was modified. She was built in, in Louisiana, obviously, but she was modified to be a fishing boat in the Northeast. She's still on operation. But he got his brains beat in now. You think about that. That's an 85 foot steel boat. See the way that boat's coming out of the water? Oh my goodness. Now imagine for a minute you're at a 65 foot aluminum boat, a trajectory that doesn't go through anything. They go out and around. Now to point my uh, point it out a little bit more, we're talking about the Northeast Atlantic. Again, this is a Google map. There's the windmill. See that little blue dot right there? Right, I put the arrow so you can see it. The nearest land is the Azores at about 2,400 miles away. I think it's 2,364 or something is what Google Earth had. There's a lot of, a lot of open ocean here, a lot of the deep ocean. And our trade winds, for the most part, are out of the east-ish, okay, easterly direction. East, southeast, to the south. You have a big area here that with no land in sight that's going to create a big groundswell. It always does. It creates a big sea and it hits this 100 fathom curve, which is the lighter blue color here. And the big groundswell gets closer together and higher. So it becomes pretty nautical. Here's a picture of the wind, uh, uh, wind farms, projected wind farms that are going to be uh, installed up and down the coast. And as you can see, they're all pretty far offshore. None of them are three or four miles off the beach. They're all a long ways off. And I want to bring something up because this dotted line here is pretty much just the Northeast Atlantic to the Mid-Atlantic, what we call it. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. Pretty much anything south of a Cape May, New Jersey, is downright rotten, okay? It, I mean, uh, anything north of Cape May, I'm, my apologies, north are downright rotten. South, it's not as bad. It gets rough, yes. But the water's warmer, so it doesn't get as hard. So again, I just want to tell you, these boats that they want to build to service the offshore wind farms on the East Coast are not going to cut it. They're going to really be dangerous boats. And I want you to pay attention to that. And Because if you're thinking of getting into the offshore wind business some, with uh, CTVs, don't build these boats. They're nice. But they are fully not functional. They are not going to work in the Northeast. I want to show you one more thing here. Let's go back to this picture. I ran a boat, a survey vessel, 180 footer out of Norfolk, Virginia, right down in here. Look at this. And we surveyed this entire Avon Grid field here, okay, which is on the North, uh, North Carolina, Virginia border. One of the roughest places I've ever gone through is the mouth of the Chesapeake going out. When it's blowing out of the east, which is common, and you have ebb tide, which happens twice a day, it is downright rotten. I'm telling you, we had to throttle back many days, and once we actually waited for the tide to turn before we could go out with a 180-foot boat. That being a 180-foot steel boat. So what do you think is going to happen with a 65-foot aluminum boat? They're going to get your brains beat in. Now look, these windmills are coming, and we have to build boats. The time is now. These boats have to uh, be begin being built because you're not going to build them in a week. It takes about six months, eight months. The first one's going to take a year. After that, you get tooled up. The shipyard gets tooled up. You may be able to uh, launch one every six months, a bigger yard, maybe one every four months. But we're going to need a lot of boats. So the time is now to get really serious about this. Now, before we go any further, you're probably wondering who is this guy, right? Who is making all of these um, accusations? They're not accusations. They're assumptions based on my experience offshore. So who am I? My, my name is Paul Forsberg. 
I'm a third generation fisherman in the Northeast, born and raised in Montauk, New York. I spent my entire life south of Martha's Vineyard. I had 30 plus years uh, in the fishing business, commercial fishing and for hire fishing in the Northeast waters. I've owned multiple boats myself, as I mentioned. My family still has eight boats. We have a fishing operation and a whale watch operation in Montauk. I've been actively involved in the boat building and modification business ever since I got out of high school in 1976. And I spent 10 years in the offshore oil business in the Gulf of Mexico. Why is that important? That's important because I got to see exactly how the Gulf of Mexico vessels operate, which is unlike anything anyone in the Northeast has ever seen. Okay, you have to, I mean, this is we're talking about organized chaos and, and, and specific vessel operations and stuff. It was just amazing how the Gulf of Mexico oil fleet operates. And anyone getting involved in the offshore wind business, service operation business up in the offshore wind, has got to have someone, if you haven't been there before, you've got to have someone on your payroll that has some experience in the Gulf of Mexico. Because moving boats back and forth with crew changes and rotation crews and all of that stuff is, it's an art. It's an art. I don't know what else you want to call it. Now, over the years, my family and I have learned, we've really discovered the hard way that aluminum boats don't work. They don't go through anything. They go over and they go around it. And they also break when it's cold. And to bring that to you, I want to tell you a tale of two boats. These are our boats. Okay, the one on the left is aluminum. She was built in the Gulf of Mexico as a crew boat originally. Someone bought the crew boat, turned her, in, turned her into a four hire fishing vessel. We got a hold of it, we turned it into a ferry. Then she also goes fi used to go fishing on weekends in the wintertime. The boat on the right is the Viking Starship. She's 140 foot long. She's built out of core 10 steel with aluminum deck house. She's built in 1977. She's a workhorse. Nothing has ever gone wrong with this, but we beat the daylights out of her. She fishes all the time. Now, this is the story I want to tell you about these two boats. The Starship is Core 10 hull, okay, Core 10 steel, aluminum deck house, like I said. The Superstar is aluminum. <clears throat> Both of these boats fished one winter south of Block Island and did a couple of trips in the Georgia Bank series because they both have bunks. They both do multi, used to do multi-day trips. This one, the one on the left, doesn't do it anymore. They fished side by side pretty much the whole winter. The Starship sailed more often than the Superstar. Both boats went to the shipyard in the spring to get painted. The Starship was steel, so you got a shave and a haircut, with power, with, uh, what we call a shave and a haircut. Power washed the bottom, put new paint on it, changed out the zinc. The Coast Guard took a look at her, we threw her in the water and she went back to work. The Superstar, on the other hand, she had cracked frames, she had a bunch of other different things go wrong with her, okay, because the aluminum gets very brittle in the winter time, in the cold, and the shipyard bill for this boat was $85,000. Okay, so the deferred maintenance was really, really high. Long story short, this boat only sails in the summertime. She stays tied to the dock in the winter. And this isn't just this boat. You take a look around. If you're in the boating business, you know what I'm talking about here. Take a look around and see how many aluminum work boats operate in the winter time. You're going to find out that there's none. If it's steel, okay. If it's not steel, it's tied to the dock. I want to bring this boat back to you again for a minute. Okay, the Starship. We built her in 1977. Her hull is core 10 steel. We've never had any damage to the hull. We beat the boat to death. She works 12 months a year. She's in just as good a shape now as she was when she was brand new. She has an aluminum deck house. And the, because the aluminum is bolted to steel, the aluminum has never had anything done to it. We took out the windows one time. I had a rogue wave that with the boat, which was relatively new. We were out where we shouldn't have been. And a rogue wave came aboard and we took out a couple of windows. But other than that, she's been a battleship. And what I want to bring uh, your attention to here is we built this boat. We didn't get her until August. She was way behind time. I got out of high school, dad said, hey kid, you gotta get and help me with this. So I came up, went up to the shipyard, Blount Marine, and I helped finish the boat. I actually, when I got out of the car, they put, gave me a grinder and a hard hat and put me right there in the corner here and told me to start grinding welds. Well, three months later, 
I was up in the mast tying, uh, putting in radar mounts and everything else like that, welding the aluminum. But here's the thing with this. We got there in June. We had to wait until the weather warmed up so the aluminum warmed up so we could weld it or we could bend it so we could weld it, you know, and fit it, what they call fitting. Aluminum doesn't work well if it's less than 45 degrees. Matter of fact, it, it has stress cracks if you bend it, if you roll it, and you can't weld it. Now, I bring that up because if you want to build aluminum boats and have them operate in the Northeast, it's going to be cold many, many months of the year. Um, let me see if this, yeah, here we go. Here's a new bed for temperatures. The warm season lasts about 3.3 months from June to September. And the average daily high temperature with the average uh, temperature above 72 degrees. The cold season is 3.3 months with an average temperature of 46. So there's three months and three months. You have six more months that are somewhere in the middle. And I'm telling you right now, aluminum boats up in the Northeast, if you have to repair them, you're only going to be able to repair them in the summertime when the weather's nice. And that's when the boats are going to have to go to work. In the wintertime, you're not going to be able to fix them and you're not going to be able to take them offshore. So it's really, in my opinion, 65 foot aluminum boat is a huge waste of money. All right, so now you're probably going out of your mind listening to all of the negatives. So now I'm going to bring you in and show you a simple common sense solution to build CTVs that are safe and efficient for the offshore wind service business. Boats like this will be functional, efficient, and safe. We're talking about catamarans, obviously. They have to be built at a core 10 steel hull. I recommend, okay? They don't have to be, but I recommend core 10 steel with the hull. Why core 10? Because it's very strong, it's pliable, it's endurable, and it's much stronger than mild steel. So the boat can be a lot lighter. And I just showed you the Starship there. She's built at a core 10, built in 77. That's what? A lot of years now, 45 years, and she's still going strong. She's just as, in just as good a shape now as she was when she was brand new. The deck houses of these boats could be aluminum or they could be composite, the same material that you build the, uh, the blades of the windmills out of. That makes it super, super stable because you have a very low center of gravity. And with a bigger boat like this on top deck, you want to put some solar panels because you want diesel electric power. Why diesel electric? Because it's very efficient. Um, it may be a little more expensive up front, but you're not going to be burning 225,000 gallons of fuel a year. You're going to burn maybe 10% of that. And when the boat is offshore and she's loitering, you could probably shut one engine down and just let the other one go to, charge, to keep the batteries charged up because she doesn't have to go fast. A boat like this only could go back and she can cruise at 15 knots. You go through the right whale area, the slope speed zone, pull it back to 10 knots. So what, you're talking maybe a, 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 a 10 mile area that where you're gonna go through the right whale area like that's gonna take you an extra, what, half hour to go through the area, big deal. Diesel electric, like I said, and you have to have five pods. You don't want jets. <clears throat> Jet boats, I'm telling you, they're very inefficient, they're expensive, they work really good when the boat's going uh, about 18 knots or above. They get quite efficient, but less than that, they're not. Okay, the boat has to get on top. And you have to use, uh, you want to use pods, propellers, and I'll tell you why. And this comes from experience in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay? When you back up a crew boat in the Gulf of Mexico with a twin engine boat, you have your hands full. You're in and out of gear, back and forth, slamming the transmissions and forward and reverse. And it's just not good for the equipment. You blow transmissions. Multi-engine boats, that's why the crew boats went to multis. They went to triples and they went to quads. Well, they ended up going to quads because if you blow one engine, you still have three. So you still, you don't sacrifice much speed. And the thing with the quads is you have two engines in forward, two in reverse. You can make that boat do whatever you want to do. When it's rough, you can have that, but you can park that boat on a soda can for crying out loud and keep it there with the four engines. So this is what you want for the boats that can service the offshore, um, offshore oil um, um, wind farms, a boat like this. 
These boats are built actually over in the UK right now, so the design is there. I actually spoke to one of the architects, and I spoke to one of the builders that build these boats. We can take the same design, do a couple little things to it to make it um, compliant to American shipping, and we can build these boats in the United States of America, anywhere in this country, because it's steel, so you don't have to worry about the temperature, and it would be a very, very efficient vessel. These boats will be functional, they'll be efficient, and they'll be safe. Now what you need really, I believe, is you need a, a boat between 110 to 120 foot long. Why? Because she has to reach across the sea. She has to sleep some people, she has to sleep 12 to 14 technicians, and she's going to have a crew of about six. You know, you're talking about two cooks, two captains, two deckhands, two engineers. The boat should go out for 7 to 14 days doing exactly what they do in the Gulf of Mexico. The boat goes out, it stays for a week, comes back in, you do your crew change, you do your uh, technician change, get your fuel, you have, you have your fuel's there, the food's there, the water's ready to go, the boat's at the dock and away from the dock within three hours. Four tops. The boat's back offshore and it's back working. This is the type of vessel that you need. Now if it's old, if it's nasty out, the boat could stay at the dock a little longer or she could go out into say vineyard sound and or and loiter around a little bit or anywhere like that you can pick up a lead you don't have to be at the dock per se everyone's on the boat no logistical problems everyone's there they're offshore if the boat's offshore and it gets rough for a couple of days or a few hours so what you do what we call weather patterns it's very common the boat's big enough to be comfortable she can handle the weather so it's not a big deal and I just want to bring on, we want to use diesel electric power for these boats. Now a boat like this that's going to work a 7 to 14 day rotation schedule somewhere in there, she's going to do about 45 trips a year, which means she's going to be out at sea at about 315 days, 315 work days. Could it be more? Maybe. Could it be less? Perhaps. But about 315 is based on my experience when I had commercial fishing boats doing six-day fishing trips. Every seventh day she hit the dock. Every Sunday she hit the dock. And we did 45 trips a year. So that's where I'm basing that on. We're talking 315 work days or so, which is 34% more work days than the smaller 65-footers. We're talking about burning somewhere in the 22,500 gallons of fuel per year, which is about 96% less fuel than the other boats. We're talking a lot less horsepower a real lot less logistical problems because the day boats, people are, the cars are not going to start, they're going to oversleep, or traffic jams, accident, picket, flat tire, got drunk the night before and didn't show up. But with those boats, the day boats are going to leave always constantly shorthanded, never leave on time. But this one, the boat's going week on, week off, comes to the dock, gets, does its changes, turns around, goes right back out. So you have less logistical problems, less parking issues, less wasted days, less dockage, again I said less parking, a much better use of human capital, and again, right whale safe. You're going to be able to see a guy driving down the road with the Escalade, obeying the speed limit at 55 miles an hour, and a possum walks across the street. He's going to see the possum, he's going to get out of the way and pass the possum. Okay, he's not going to hit it at 80 knots, at 80 mile an hour and, and kill it like a, like a Prius would. So these boats would be much more right well safe. Now, <clears throat> we only have two choices. The boats have to be built. S uh, offshore wind is coming. The boats have got to be built. And uh, we have two choices in the matter here. The first choice is we build the same boats as they have overseas that I just showed you these little 65-footers. You run them through much rougher water than they run them overseas. You risk killing people and whales, and you risk losing a ton of money with repairs. I mean, so there's choice number one if you want to go that route. The second route is build the right boat for the job, what I just showed you. The Viking Starship is about the only one of her kind. She built out of core 10 steel. She fishes in all weather. Don't believe me. Ask anyone. The boat is a legend in the fishing business. She's a battleship. Build the boats out of core 10 steel. Build these things that are going to last for 
30, 40, 50 years for crying out loud. These boats will last a lot longer than the windmills will. That's the boat you want to build. And I want to bring the cost, because uh, you may be going through your head, okay, well, a aluminum boat, 65 foot, is going to be a lot less to build than 110 foot steel. Have you looked at the price of aluminum lately? Have you thought of the man, amount of man hours that are going to be wasted building an aluminum boat because you have to heat the metal up before you can weld it? Have you thought about the cracks and the deferred maintenance that the aluminum hulls are going to have when you haul out in the shipyard? Consider a minute the amount of cost that's going to be to rebuild the jet drives on the back of these boats. It's going to be a lot more money to build the 65 foot boat and then just build 110. And by the way, steel is a lot cheaper to work with and a lot cheaper to buy than aluminum. And you can build the boat. Steel is very easy to work with in colder weather. No, you don't want to weld it if it's below about 25 degrees, 28 degrees, but you can weld it like the Dickens in 45 and 40 degree weather. Not a big deal in the mid thirties. So there you have two choices. Do what they do overseas and run them in much rougher weather, risk killing people. And if you do that, there's going to be a court case and they'll be calling me as, a, as an expert witness, my guest. Or the second, like I said, build the right boats for the right job. Now we've spent about 20 minutes together here. I hope I covered some stuff and answered some questions for you. I couldn't possibly cover everything in this little video. You'd go out of your mind with it. But I'd be happy to jump on the phone with you if you'd like, if it's worth 15 minutes of your time. So you can learn a little bit more of what I have to say and learn how to build the right CTV that can handle the weather in the offshore wind farms. And I can even help you with the logistical planning and everything else like that. If you're interested, all you have to do is give me a call. So here's what you do next. Pick up the phone. Give me a call, 877-207-8652, or shoot me an email. We'll go back and forth. We can set up a time and figure out what we can do to... Uh, have a conversation. Thanks for your time. I hope you have a good day and I hope this video saves a couple of lives. I really do. I really don't want to go to court as a professional witness. Give me a ring. Talk to you. Thank you very much.